Well, thanks for coming to the last in our case handling series for this year. Um, again, my name is Jeff Thayer. I'm going to be covering uh, most of the civil portion this evening. And um, uh, we thank you all for coming, especially those of you who have been, who have been able to make it to uh, most or all of our sessions so far. Um, before you leave tonight, very important that, as always, you take one of the eval forms in the front and fill it out. Um, and in addition to filling it out as you normally would at the end of every class, uh, we would love to get recommendations for next year. We're thinking about doing a similar series of classes, but a little more um, in-depth into certain areas, uh, since for these classes we were kind of going more generally over a lot of different things. So if there are you know specific um, things that you're interested in learning more about, like expert depositions or um, certain criminal law motions or, you know, things that you're running into in your practice that you would like some more information about, uh, please list those on the eval form and we'll take a look at those later and that, that'll give us some ideas for what to do next year. Um, also, uh, there's one other thing, Marta, you wanted me to mention. Um, well, it slipped my mind, so if you remember later, just let me know and I'll mention it before I leave. Um, so, Last time I talked about all of the pretrial and um, opening statement um, material that goes into a civil trial. Uh, once you've gotten past the opening statements, you're in the meat of the case. And um, you know, whether you're the plaintiff or the defendant, you're thinking about the best way to put on your case with the witnesses you have, um, or you know, depending on which side you're on, the best way to poke holes in your opponent's case. Um, so think about. You know, most of your time, while there's going to be documents that you might read in the record and, and videotape depositions that you might play for the jury, most of your time in the, your case in chief is going to be spent organizing and putting on your witnesses. Um, think carefully about what order you want to put your witnesses in. And, um, you know, real life comes into play in these things, too. Uh, certain witnesses might have certain availabilities and others may, may not. So that might have an effect on how you order them. But, you know, as much as possible, you want to tell a story to the jury that makes sense. Um, a lot of times there will be a series of events in your case that, you know, just makes sense to tell chronologically because that will make the most sense to the jury. Um, there may be certain discrete subject matters within the overall purview of your case and it, it may make sense for you to present those to the jury in a certain order. Um, as much as possible, try to start out and end with strong witnesses. You, wanna, um, you want your first witness to give a good first impression of your case to the jury, and you want to go out with a bang, too. Um, you know, if, if you're doing, for example, personal injury cases, the plaintiff, uh, a lot of times it'll make sense for you to have your client go first. Um, he's the one who has uh, the real story to tell about how he got injured. And, um, um, you know, it, pr presuming that he, he's a decent witness for you, he's going to help you make that good first impression with the jury. But you may have a case, and it just depends on the case and the issues you have, where, um, you know, it's a personal injury, but you've got a complicated medical issue, or you've got some complicated disease, or, or something that, that you would rather the jury have a context for what's going on before they actually see your client. So, you know, in that case, um, and particularly if you've got a strong expert witness, I might actually start out with that strong expert witness too to kind of lay out some of the some of the issues that the jury may not deal with every day and may not be too familiar with. And then once those issues are laid out, um, put your client, the plaintiff, on, and, and when he explains how he got injured and so forth, the jury will have sort of a context to put that injury in. Um, now, when, you're, uh, when your opponent's putting on their case and you're doing your cross, or you're getting ready to do your cross, pay attention to what they're doing on their direct. Um, you want to, as much as possible, poke holes uh, in your opponent's case, and part of that is going to be uh, monitoring what, what the testimony is on direct. Is that consistent? with what they said in their deposition, because a lot of times, most of the time, if not all the time, uh, these witnesses should have been deposed uh, during the discovery phase of the case. So, you know, as, as the uh, 
other side, uh, when your opponent is putting on their case in chief, pay attention to what their witnesses are saying. Um, and if there's anything inconsistent about what they're saying, make sure that you um, address that up front in your cross. Um, the nice thing about being in a civil case is that you do have these depositions to rely on for the trial testimony. Um, if you're the one who's putting on your case, uh, you want to make sure you go over with all of your witnesses um, what they said in the deposition. You know, make sure they've reviewed that again before they testify at trial. Um, make sure they know what the likely issues are that your opposing counsel is going to try to uh, point out to them on cross. And, and just make sure they're comfortable with what they previously said in their deposition and, um, and that they're going to um, testify at trial consistently with what, what they said in the deposition or, um, and hopefully this isn't the case, but if there is something different that they have a, a really good reason for why their testimony is now different. Um, on the other hand, when you're on cross and you're looking at the, the depositions of the witnesses um, uh, who your opposing counsel is putting on, um, you want to outline your cross so that um, as you go down the questions you want to hit, um, you know where the deposition testimony is that you need to refer to in case they start going off the script. So if you're cross-examining someone and they they give a response to a question you ask that's completely different from how they responded to the same question uh, during the, when you took the deposition. Um, what you need to do is um, get them back on track. So you'll, you'll have your outline of the cross-examination. You'll have the citation to the place in the deposition where you need to go. Um, you've previously lodged the deposition transcripts with the court. So all you need to do at that point is pick up the transcript and say, uh, Mr. Smith, uh, do you remember giving de deposition testimony in this case on October 14, 2013? Yes. Uh, and, and at that time, you, were, you took an oath to tell the truth, correct? Yeah. So you kind of lead them down the path of um, confirming that they, they took a deposition in the case, that they took an oath to tell the truth, um, that you admonish them at the start of the deposition, uh, that if they didn't understand a question, they should let you know so you could create the best record possible. Um, and, you know, just get them to confirm that all that was put on the record and, and they took an oath. And then you can either have them read their testimony at that deposition in the record or you can go ahead and read it. All, all you're doing is you're establishing that they took an oath to tell the truth at an earlier proceeding in the case and they said one thing, which is different from what they're saying now. Um, and that's impeaching the witness through deposition testimony. You could do similar things if, um, for example, they've submitted declarations uh, supporting motions previously in the case, or, or if there's other material you have in your case uh, in discovery that, um, that they author that's different from what they're saying at trial. Um, and, and that's one of the, the important things you want to do on cross is um, because you're going to be asking leading questions because you already know what, what the person said at deposition. So you're, you're tailoring your cross very specifically to what they said at their depot. You're hopefully going to be asking all leading questions because you already know what they're going to say. And if they start saying something different, um, you want to get them back on track uh, to, to where the, the evidence is from the discovery you, you already did in the case. Um, keep in mind that with, with lay and expert witnesses, although you're going to be Starting out with each type of witness by asking some background questions. They're for their very different purposes um, With lay witnesses you want to Lay out to the jury who this person is why they're important to the case um, You know if there's an incident in question in the case um, um, You know how they have knowledge of the incident whether they were present and whatnot um, During that portion of the examination and again, this is direct examination uh, you, you'll probably get a lot of leeway from the judge uh, in terms of asking leading questions because um, the judge and opposing counsel just want you to get through this background material um, as quickly as you can before getting to the meat of the testimony, unless in some unusual cases there may be a, a dispute about um, the accuracy of some of the, the background material you're going through. But for lay witnesses, that's what you're doing. You're laying out for the jury who this person is and why they're important before you get to the meat of the testimony. Uh, with the expert witnesses, you're also asking background questions to start out with, but you're doing that to qualify the person 
as an expert before you get into their substantive opinions of the case. Um, so you're asking questions about their education, um, their professional experience, um, you're, and you're really hitting at where they have uh, training and experience in the specific issue or issues that you're offering them for testimony in the case. So uh, if you've got a pathologist up on the stand, you're, you're getting to his general education and background, but you're hitting specifically at his uh, education and pathology and his training in that field and his professional experience, um, professional memberships, things like that. Um, and then once you get through that, you proceed to examining them about what their assignment was in the case and what opinions they've reached in the case and, and so forth. Um, if you're crossing an expert, make sure that at some point you hit on um, the fact that they're being compensated uh, for their testimony. I wouldn't spend a whole lot of time on it because all of the experts are being compensated, but you do want to point that out. Um, it's something you should have already asked at the deposition, so you already know what the answer is going to be. Um, just to you know, make clear in the jury's mind that this is a professional witness being compensated for their testimony. Um, with expert witnesses, uh, there will sometimes be uh, the need to have a 402 hearing. Either you'll request it or your opposing counsel will request it of one of your experts. Um, and technically, that request could be made um, midway through the expert's testimony when the questions about his background have been asked and before you or opposing counsel gets to the substantive testimony. In reality, requests for evidence code 402 hearings normally come up much earlier than that. Um, in fact, a lot of times what I do with motions in limine that relate to experts is request in the alternative uh, a 402 hearing if the judge decides not to grant the motion in limine. Um, and a lot of judges, e even if I don't do that, a lot of judges will have in their pretrial orders a specific deadline by which they want to know if you're making any request for a 402 hearing as to a specific expert. And the 402 hearing is, uh, it's normally, it doesn't have to be, but it's normally held outside um, of the jury. So if, if necessary, the jury's excused for it, although they usually try to schedule it so they don't have to, to do that to waste time. Um, it's basically a mini cross-examination of the expert's background and qualifications to render the expert opinion that he's being offered for. Um, so just be aware that that'll come up. Uh, you'll either request them or perhaps deal with a request from opposing counsel for them. Um, and there's in the outline that I hope all of you received via email, there are specific citations to code sections that cover some of the points I've raised about direct testimony and cross examination. Um, and the hope is that by the time you get through your case in chief with all of your witnesses, that you've laid out for the jury, um, you know, a logical. Um, um, procession as to what evidence you have and, and why the evidence is favorable for you. Even if you haven't tied it all together and you're closing yet, they still should have an idea by the end of your case in chief of what your main points were, who your key witnesses were, and what their key points were. Um, and you're going to tie that all together in the closing argument. And, and it's truly an argument. It's not like an opening where you kind of have to say, well, the evidence, I believe, is going to show this, and this witness, I, I believe, is going to say this. In the closing, you're tying together all those points of evidence, and you're laying it out for the jury in a way that should make it easy for them to reach the conclusion that you want them to reach. Um, and, and on the other side, if your opponent is doing something in closing that's improper, if, for example, he's misstating uh, key points of the evidence, or he's um, improperly appealing to the passions of the jury, or and there's a few other things that aren't um, aren't uh, appropriate during closing arguments. Um, you do want to make the uh, objection at that time um, to preserve it for appeal uh, if it's a serious enough point. I, I'd be careful about doing it every time your opponent arguably does something improper during closing because you don't want to focus all of the attention on you and what you're, you're objecting to, but you do want to be mindful of preserving things for appeal if you feel at the end of the case that your opponent's misrepresenting something. Um, you know, so that's basically 
what I had to say about um, testimony and, and closing arguments. And Natasha is going to go over uh, some post-trial motions and deadlines. But um, before I turn it over to her, does anyone have any questions? No? Um, oh, yeah. How often do you actually see improper closing arguments? Um, it's more often little things where you're like, should I object to this, should I not? I mean, especially with experienced trial attorneys who um, have done it a few times before, they're, they're already going to have a sense for what, what they can do and what they can't do. And the court will typically give you a lot of latitude in closing anyways. I mean, it's your job as the attorney arguing the closing to um, discuss points of evidence and, um, and tell the jury where you think those points of evidence lead, even if you don't have, um, you know, a smoking gun or something like that. So, I mean, you are allowed a lot, a great deal of latitude in, in explaining what you think the reasonable inference from the evidence is and where you think it leads. Um, so, I, I find, especially with experienced trial counsel, it's more often um, smaller points where, where you're thinking carefully about whether you want to make the objection. Um, and if they're an experienced trial counsel, they shouldn't be misrepresenting the evidence. I mean, there may be a point where um, they're talking about a piece of evidence and there is some conflicting evidence in the case, and so you would, on your uh, rebuttal, want to point out that there's some conflicting evidence, but I, you know, in that situation, I would uh, wait to rebut that instead of uh, objecting, because you probably don't have a proper objection there. Um, Totally misrepresenting evidence is more rare, and so I don't think you'll see it all that often, but you should just, um, you know, it's something to pay attention to and something to be aware of. So. I think I'm wrong pretty much now who I am, but for those of you who are new, I'm Natasha Chi. Um, I practice uh, civil litigation for a little bit, and I do entertainment law, IP law, and some criminal defense as well. So, so today I'm going to be talking about post-trial issues motions and um, so just briefly to mention that there are memorandum of costs so the prevailing party who claims um, costs they must serve um, you know and file verified memorandum of costs no later than 15 days after um, the mailing of the notice of entry of judgment so um, that's something to be mindful of also an opposing party's notice of motion to strike and tax costs must be served and filed um, at least 15 days later. So um, I put some other notes in here in the outline so you can refer to that as well. Um, there's also the motion for attorney's fees, attorney fees. Now this is for um, the prevailing party and it is only um, for those that are contractually or statutorily entitled to attorney fees. So if it's not one of those things, you cannot ask for attorney fees. So make sure it's, it's um, either in the contract or it's um, allowed under statute for that. Um, the other thing too is um, good faith settlement offsets. So this is when the prevailing party, um, it's the party with the net monetary recovery. So let's say there are many defendants in a case and there's a settlement um, before the trial is over and these um, offsets are, or these um, amounts are, are then offset for the damages that are occurred over the trial. So it would be given a percentage um, offset towards um, the, the amount, right? Do you want to explain a little bit more, Joe? Yeah, they're offset um, in a ratio of economic to non-economic damages. So um, during one of our earlier sessions, uh, I think one of us mentioned Prop 51, uh, which is a statute in the California Civil Code um, where defendants are joint and severally liable for certain damages and not for others. So um, at the end of a case, if there are other defendants if you're one of the defendants who went to, through the verdict and there are other defendants who settled out first, um, those settlements are going to be offset against 
the award for economic damages, but not for non-economic damages. And they're not going to be offset one to one. They're going to be offset in a ratio, um, in the ratio of the economic damages to the non-economic damages per the jury verdict. So when the jury returns a verdict, they're going to have one line that says, we award economic damages in amount X, and another line that says we award non-economic damages uh, in the amount Y. And that ratio is going to be um, the percentage of the total settlements that are offset against the award of economic damages. So. And that's outlined in that case, right? Yeah, Great House. It's a 1990s um, California case. Uh, we can give someone the site. I think it's in your outline. Is that right? Okay. It's not in my outline for some reason. But Okay. Yeah, so that's um, that outlines like how to calculate it and everything. Okay, so let's say um, you've lost a trial, and what can you do? So you have two options. You can do a motion um, for judgment notwithstanding the verdict, the JNOV, or you can, and you can file a motion for a new trial. So these two motions are usually filed simultaneously, um, and they're usually heard simultaneously and ruled upon simultaneously as well. So um, uh, JNOV is, is a motion that challenges the legal sufficiency of the opposing party's evidence at trial. So it acts like a demur to the evidence. Um, and this is a motion that the losing party brings, obviously, right? So um, it's, it, either party may make a JNOV. It doesn't have to be a plaintiff or a defendant. It can be either one, whoever is, is the losing party. Um, also, the court may make this um, motion sua sponte. They have the power to do that as well. Um, it has the same function as a motion for non-suit or a directed verdict, um, but that it is brought after a verdict um, for the opposing party has been rendered. <coughs> so uh, a directed verdict motion is brought um, either at the close of plaintiff's um, case or even after um, close of defendant's case, but before the trial is over. So this um, is different in the sense that it is brought after a verdict has been brought forth. So I've also given some definitions for what a non-suit um, and directed verdict is in case you are not familiar with that. Um, so some strategies to think about. So these are usually brought together, um, a JNOV and a motion for new trial. Um, Jeff wanted to talk a little bit about timing, right? Yeah, they're, um, they're annoyingly um, not provided with the same rules for dates of filing, um, dates of opposition, dates of replies. Um, so, and a lot of times you'll be filing them on the same issue, uh, like punitive damages or whatever the issue is that that you want to try to reverse. Um, if you have a situation like that, I've gone to next party before and gotten the deadlines uh, rearranged so that you're filing the motions at the same time, they're being opposed at the same time, and so forth. Um, the court's usually happy to do that because it's easier for them to keep track of as well. And opposing counsel is usually happy with that too because I mean, they, you know, and they should, fewer and they deadlines should for them, heard. the better. And they should be heard together because a JNOV is basically an alternative or like a backup to a new, a new trial. Or a new trial, I'm sorry. A new trial is a backup to a JNOV. In case your JNOV doesn't um, get granted, then your second bite is the is the um, motion for new trial. So that's why you would want it both on the same date. Um, okay. okay, so you can also have a partial JNOV. The court, the court can uh, rule on on less than all of the issues at, at hand. So it's not necessarily an all or nothing scenario. Whereas a motion for a new trial, it is basically a ruling on, on the entire case, right? So um, that's one thing. Also, uh, following a verdict, um, awarding both compensatory and punitive damages, the court can grant a partial JNOV in favor of, let's say, just the punitive damages or just um, economic damages. So that that's also something to think about. Um, okay, let's see. And then I've also listed some time limits for filing the motion. Um, you can go over that in your outline as well.
as well. Um, but usually it's before um, before entry of judgment or within 15 days after the clerk's mailing of the notice of entry of judgment or 15 days after service by a party written notice of entry of judgment. So um, these are some gu uh, guidelines to look at here. Um, the format of the motion, um, you need a notice of motion. It would be titled Notice of Motion for Judgment Notwithstanding the Verdict. Um, it's not a law in motion um, proceeding notice by parties, so no hearing date is necessarily included um, because it is set by the order of the court. Also, if the court does this motion so sponte, they um, give notice five days, five days notice to all parties before the hearing. Um, so the moving party should advise the other party of any dates of the hearings that are, are coming up, when entry of judgment was served, uh, when the, you know, when jurisdiction to rule on the motions will expire and these things. So keep this in mind if you are the moving party. Um, you should also include a proposed order um, attached with it and you should provide a proof of service and include a copy of the served notice of entry of judgment as well. Um, the opposing party, they may serve and file papers in response to the motion. This can include um, points and authorities, um, excerpts from the trial trans transcript. Um, they may include affidavits and declarations, but usually not because that would be considered new, to, um, new evidence. So this is basically based on what happened during the trial. So most of it is going to be based off of the trial transcripts, right? So. Um, the opposing paper should be served and filed uh, within the same time limits as um, new trial motions, so within 10 days after serving and filing um, or service of the moving papers. Um, okay, so the hearing on the motion, they, so oral arguments may or may not be uh, permitted by the judge, so be prepared for either. Um, if oral arguments are permitted, the clerk must notify all parties uh, five days before the hearing that there will be oral arguments. Um, the JNOV and the motion for new trial hearings are usually heard on the same day, like I said, so you know, be prepared for that to happen. Um, so the disposition on appeal, so it makes sense. If the JNOV is granted by a trial court, but then it is reversed on appeal, the, um, the, the jury's verdict would then automatically be reinstated, right? So, and then the same thing happened. If the trial court um, denied the JNOV, but then later on appeal it was granted, um, then, the, um, then the appellate court basically makes the JNOV granted and the jury's verdict is then null, right? And um, if both a JNOV and a new trial is granted, and after appeal, the JNOV is grant is still upheld. Then um, the new trial will just be dismissed, and you'll just have the JNOV um, in effect. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay. So the next thing is the motion for new trial. Um, the motion for new trial basically asks the court to or the trial court to reexamine one or more issues of fact or law after a trial and decision by judge or jury. Um, it's basically um, when a miscarriage of justice has been shown. Yeah, the error must likely have affected the outcome of the trial. Um, the court, unlike in a JNOV, does not have sua sponte power. So you have to, the losing party must bring this motion. It, the court cannot do it on its own accord. Um, and it's purely statutorily granted as well. So um, the effect of ordering, um, order granting a new trial is basically like you've started a new trial process again. So all the clocks start um, start over again. The cutoff dates are all set for from the date um, for retrial, um, from the date that the order was granted. So keep that in mind as well. Um, Okay, so I've also included some motions or some things that are not subject to challenge. Uh, default judgment, uh, obviously, because there was not really a trial there. So, um, and ch 
judgments by agreement or stipulation, right? Um, okay, and then when a mistrial has been declared, court can order action be retried under CCP 616, um, but not for a new trial. Um, trial court cannot order a new trial in a small claims appeal, so I guess you're out of luck if you're a small claims, you can't redo it. Um, and then grounds for a new trial, these are all purely statutory, um, statutorily mandated. Um, they can be irregularities in the proceedings um, of the court, the jury, adverse party, um, any court order, um, of court like abusive discretion, um, anything that would prevent you from having like a fair trial, that, that would be grounds for um, a new trial. Also irregularity in the proceedings of the court, so if there was any sort of misconduct by the judge or by um, any other factor in the courtroom or anything that would cause a material um, effect where it you know, prejudiced one side and caused that. So that's basically it for the post-trial motions and issues. Do you guys have any other questions? Or? Steve. Are there any um, issues where if you don't put it in a, if you don't file a motion for JNOV or a motion for new trial, you don't put an issue in there that it's waived for appeal? I know in federal court it's like that. So the motion, the, the motions for JNOV and new trial end up being a laundry list of everything you might possibly want to appeal on. Right. If you don't put it in there, it's gone. Right. Do you I like mean, that in state court as well? I'm not aware of any you would waive. Um, I know the last time we did a JNOV new trial motion, it was limited only to the issue of punitive damages. Um, and actually, now that I mention it, that is one area in closing arguments where you do see a lot of objections, uh, is, the, is where the plaintiffs are arguing for punitives because they have to meet a much higher standard, and so they make much more of a strong argument, and so you, you do tend to get a lot more objections there. But um, in, in the motion motions we did, they were limited strictly to punitives, but I know on appeal, we appealed many more issues, and those were handled by appellate counsel, but, um, so I, no, I'm, to answer your question, I'm not aware of any that you would waive by not putting it in one of those motions. And they're certainly not compulsory motions. Um, although, if you're on the losing side of a lawsuit, um, you definitely want to seriously consider doing that, um, especially with punitives, like, and actually the one we did, uh, the JNOV ended up being granted, so we got the punitives thrown out, and of course, that's now being appealed, but at least we're on the good end of that ruling instead of the bad end like we were before. So it's definitely um, something you want to consider doing, uh, depending on the issues in your case. Well. That's a very good question. Anybody else? Marta? Uh, so what is the difference between a mistrial that's been declared and an order for a new trial just for the newbies? Yeah. Okay, so, I don't know, maybe Jeff has a clear way. Of well, I mean, a mistrial would have occurred at some point. Like before. Um, before verdict? Yeah. yeah, I mean, like jury misconduct on the third day of trial. Or witness or tampering like or evidence tampering, something like yeah. that. Yeah, and when you're, the, so the motion for new trial that she's talking about is basically, it's a backup in case you don't win the JNOB motion. That's the one you really want because that gives you the result you want. And if you don't get that motion, the second best thing is to get another opportunity to prove your case, which is the motion for new trial. So that's what, what that's for. So the JNOV is kind of like a, like I wrote a third bite of the apple. So you know, after all, that, if you don't get a directed verdict, you know, you get all these things, then you can do the JNOV. But the mistrial is really like a backup to the JNOV. So. Well, you mean the motion for new trial? I mean motion for new trial. Yeah. Okay, so Dorian's next. I have, a, I have a question. Oh. Just, uh -huh. just, I want to understand the language here. That the, in the, under the category motion is not subject to challenge. Uh, so when the mistrial has been declared, court can order action to be tried under CCP 660, but not the new trial. What's the difference between being tried under 616 and a new trial? What's the difference between? Okay, so your question is? It just sounds like the, they sound the same, a new trial or a new trial. I'm not sure. When a mistrial has been declared, court can order action be retried under CCP 616, but not for a new trial. So, um, I guess because it's been granted a mistrial, then it, does this new trial?
mistrial motion for new trial is after a verdict has been, has been um, given out. So, so in the mistrial, is that right, Jeff? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, one that's of the, the distinction, right? One of the distinctions too could be if you've got um, you know a trial with two phases where you've got like a liability and punitive phase. You might have. Um, um, I know we a couple years ago had a case where the second phase was retried. Uh, but I think so, actually. Next year. Yeah, I mean, I think the I think the practical result would be either way you're, you're trying some issues again, but I, I think if I'm reading this correctly, <laughs> correctly yeah. um, 616 is just the authority for the court to um, to retry an action when they've declared a mistrial, but for a motion for a new trial, that authority comes under different sections, which are 656 and 657. So I, I think it's just different statutory um, provisions for giving a new governing the two different things, but the practical result um, could be the same. You know, is it the same? Except, for example, the judge decides to after after a mistrial, he orders a retrial. Is it like giving a trial in the sense there's not going to be the same? All the new dates open, and all the discovery and everything. Else, it's going to be just order that that particular part retried without starting everything. Is that what they mean? Yeah, so so in, in the motion we did, if we had not gotten the JNOB, but we did get the motion for new trial, um, because ours was a, a two-phase trial, we would have only retried the second phase, which mercifully was much shorter than the first phase, um, and which only dealt with that issue of punitive damages. Um, where, where the issue is not punitives, but it's something, but it was like a sub-part of a one-phase trial, then you would, you would um, um, you know, you could potentially could Try the whole thing, but if, if it's unnecessary to, um, you know, the motion for new trial would be restricted as much as possible, or whatever the issue was that that it was determined um, should have come out differently, or, or might have come out. Differently. Right. It looks like just looking at the language of the code. Oh, sure. It, it says in all cases where the jury are discharged without having rendered a verdict, or are prevented from giving a verdict by reason of accident or some other cause, mm -hmm. then during the progress of the trial or after. Uh, mostly familiar crowd, but there's a few new faces, so I'll briefly introduce myself. Um, I'm in private practice. I do criminal defense. I've been practicing for about six years, first four and a half of which were in the DA's office here in Contra Costa County. So, um, so that's my background, and let's get right into it. So this is part five, and this is the last class in the criminal series. And I originally entitled it Rips and Appeals, and then I thought about it a little bit more, and then I called it post-trial, but if I was being more creative, I probably would have called it shit to file after your obviously innocent client gets convicted. <laughs> All right? And like that, no one under 17 can watch this video on YouTube. So here's, so, so, so pretty much here's, here's what we got. Um, so you go to trial, and I guess none of you guys will ever need this lecture because this is only talking about, you know, when the verdict comes back guilty. So, um, so you come back, verdict comes back guilty. And the answer is, I mean, and the question is, what do I do now, right? And what do I have to do? What are my obligations? What are my options? So that's what we're talking about today. So the first thing uh, we're going to talk about are sort of the pre-judgment motions. And I guess the first question is, what the hell do we mean when we say judgment? Because that word really had no meaning to me when I started doing criminal practice, right? What the hell is judgment? And judgment is really just a fancy way of saying sentencing. So at the time the judge basically gives your client a sentence, whether that be jail time, probation, or fines, or whatever else it may be, that is judgment, all right? And usually there's some delay 
from the time that your client may be found guilty to the time that he is sentenced. All right. So um, obviously, if they enter a plea, um, those will often happen at the exact same time. Although they don't have to, but most of the time they do. Uh, but of course, in the context of a trial, they almost always will happen at separate times. All right. So. Uh, Pre-judgment motions, there's really just one I'm gonna really spend any time talking about, and that's a motion for a new trial. Frankly, the motion for a new trial is pretty much the exact same thing as you heard for the civil practitioners. Basically, you're saying something really unfair or bad happened in the trial, and it should be invalidated as a result. Um, every motion for a new trial, I think both in criminal and civil contexts, are a bit of a long shot. I would guess that the chances of winning one of those is probably in the single digits and probably in the low single digits. Although when I was a DA, I did have one granted against me, which uh, <laughs> you guys should all be very happy about. <laughs> so I know about this well. Um, but, um, but they don't happen that often. And it was not for prosecutorial misconduct. Well, <laughs> so, so, um, so I listed the reasons here. I'm not going to go through all of them. Um, but I'm going to go through just a couple that I think are kind of hot right now that you want to pay attention to. Absence of the defendant at trial, that's not when your guy missed the bus and didn't show up. All right, That's for when he had a right to be there. Maybe he was in sheriff custody or something and they didn't bring him. All right? um, jury misconduct is the biggie. It's the biggie. Why is this so big right now? What made jurors go AWOL? I'll give you a hint. And, then, and, our, and our president knows. Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, all right? So this is a huge issue. Jurors have been thinking these things and saying these things and doing all the things that they've been doing forever. Everyone knows this, but now they broadcast it, so it's out there for, for everyone. And so this is a really big deal these days. Um, I actually uh, know an attorney right now who has a case going on, um, actually a very serious case, where one of the jurors was on Twitter doing the trial and the deliberations, tweeting things about how everyone, everyone's guilty until proven innocent, this guy has no shot, he's going to convince the whole jury to vote guilty, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that attorney is preparing a motion for a new trial. And uh, as told to me, when the judge saw these tweets prior to hearing the motion, or at least heard sort of the initial basis for the motion, his jaw hit the ground. So this is a big one. If you can find out any information about your jurors, Google them. You know, um, I don't see any ethical problems with that because it's public information. Um, do not pretext, so do not make up some name of someone you think they know and pretend to be that person on Facebook and then friend them. That's bad news. <laughs> All right, All right. But, but, if you, but if you go out there and it's public information, stuff that's not private on their Facebook, using your true identity or, you know, and you find stuff, that's all fair game. All right, so keep your eyes open for that. Um, Do I have a yeah, we got a question. The uh, jurors that uh, tweet, are they ever sanctioned? The answer is it's a sensitive thing. I mean, in general, um, the courts have gotten better at very directly telling jurors not to use Facebook, Twitter, and things like that. In fact, I think they may have been incorporated into the jury instructions in the last year or two. Um, but at the same time, even when I've seen instances of juror misconduct, I have not really seen that juror get punished. I mean, in theory, they should, but really the focus is on uh, the defendant and what remedy that person should get. You know, typically speaking, I think if the defense attorney gets a new trial because of juror misconduct, no one who gives a damn about the juror at this point, right? Your client just got a new trial, right? So, so, so for sort of uh, practical reasons, I haven't really seen it, but of course, the judges threatened it. Um, and actually, has anyone, there are people who have been practicing a little bit longer than me here, um, has anyone actually seen a juror ever get actually held in contempt or in trouble for juror misconduct? I've never seen it. Not in 46 years. OK, so, so, that, gives, so, that, so that gives you an idea. Not in 46, not in 46 years. So, um, so that's, pretty much, that's pretty much that. Um, there's a motion to strike enhancements or special findings. Um, some enhancements um, in cases can sometimes be uh, stricken. You'll often see this with strikes um, in felony cases. Um, obviously, I've, we've tailored this to misdemeanors, but I just want to highlight that a lot of times judges will sometimes uh, do what's called striking strikes in order to not have to give someone a mandatory 
um, a statutorily mandatory sentence. Um, and there's also a motion and arrest of judgment, which before doing research for this class, I had never heard of. Look it up, it actually exists, and it's a real thing. So, um, what do you put in a motion for a new trial, or what's your mindset when you're writing this thing? Um, knowing that it only has a single digit chance of success. Well, if you have an issue like juror misconduct, and you got a legit issue, that's all you write about, okay? Just take your issue, run with it if you got a legitimate one. Most of the time, you don't. And if you don't, I still like this motion, and the reason I like it is because it's a way that you can communicate to both your client and to the appellate lawyer um, before your client is no longer your client. Because once your client gets sentenced, you'll never see them again, you know, closed case, goes in a drawer, right, uh, many times. Um, but for your client, he may be thinking about appeal, he may be thinking about federal habeas help, he may be thinking about all these things down the road that you probably won't be appointed to or probably won't be able to help that person with. But if you lay out some federal habeas arguments in your motion for a new trial, and you lay out some grounds of appeal in your motion for a new trial, and then as appellate lawyer gets that, they have kind of a roadmap to the issues that you thought were important as the trial attorney. And then your client, after he loses appeal, if he loses his appeal, can now go to the federal district court, and he doesn't have a right to an attorney, but he has a nice federal argument laid out that he can handwrite and submit. Um, and you might think, wow, you know, that's a long shot, and it is, but. Um, I've heard of several instances of people getting relief from the district courts and the Ninth Circuit on federal habeas grounds. Um, the most common that I've heard of is Batson-Wheeler challenges because the Ninth Circuit uses a slightly different standard than the state courts. And uh, they, they permit sort of what's called a comparative analysis, and I don't want to go into that too too much detail. But the, short of, the, the long and short of it is they're much more friendly on some issues than the state courts are. So your guy actually does have a shot in federal court if he can articulate the argument, which of course he can't without a lawyer, which is why you put it in the motion to new trial, and you send it to him, and he has it, and he can just copy it when he's uh, in jail with nothing better to do with his time. So. Let's talk about uh, sentencing and the hearing and the timing and uh, those issues. So your client gets found guilty once he gets sentenced. Anyone know? He can be right there, right? He can be. He can be. Yeah, so here's the deal. There's a statute, um, and it pretty much says that your client has uh, a right to what's called a cooling off period. That's at least six hours, all right? So. Um, Basically, the idea is that, right, the judge just heard a whole bunch of bad stuff your client did and made me inflamed by them. The idea is that, you know, everyone goes home, sleep, you know, come back the next day and you're cooled off and, um, you know, after, after the emotion and stuff of the trial has worn off. So he has a right for at least basically a day. Um, and then uh, misdemeanor charge, usually they have to be sent within 10 days, okay? Uh, that's calendar days. The, your client can, of course, waive that if they want and be sentenced either on the spot or be sentenced on the back end, you know, kind of beyond the 10 days. Um, and there are a couple exceptions in the statute for different scenarios, which I've laid out in my guide. Um, if the court, if your guy's out of custody and the court's thinking about probation, they can push off sentence and give probation some time to do some investigation and whatnot. Obviously, if your guy's in custody, you probably don't want to waive time for sentencing, particularly in a misdemeanor case where exposure's not that high. Um, in a death penalty case or life cases, it's very common for defendants to waive time for sentencing because they're not going anywhere fast and it gives you more time to do research for things like mitigation um, and or grounds for a new trial. Um, when the hearing actually happens, for the most part as a defense attorney, you actually don't have to do a whole lot, right? I mean, you do want to do a couple things, which I'll mention, but I mean, the actual hearing itself, you're just kind of going to be sitting there with a couple exceptions. But before sentencing, you have a right to present a statement to the judge. Um, and that statement can be in writing, and probably should be in writing, and you can present, hey, you know, yeah, my client was found guilty of this, but here are some things about his background, here are some things you didn't know, um, and you can present them in the best light you can. You can get letters from friends, relatives, clergy, things like that, and submit it all to the judge. Um, I think it's a good idea if you, if you can do that because it does, I think those things do help. And I think the judges particularly tend to be impressed if they know that someone who's going to get out of jail has a support network who they can sort of fall back on. Um, so the sentencing ha hearing happens. 
and the judge is going to start talking. He's probably going to give both counsel an opportunity to speak. And um, I'm not going to go into exactly what to say, but obviously you're going to ask for a sentence that you think is appropriate. And the DA is going to ask for a sentence much above what you probably think is appropriate. And then the judge is going to sentence your client. Now, many judges do this many different ways. Um, the case law and the statutes have suggested a certain way of doing it. Um, and what they should be doing is giving you what is their proposed sentence and then giving both sides a chance to comment on their proposed sentence, okay? Because you hear the proposed sentence, and if you hear something that you don't like or a probation condition that you think is sketchy, you can say, well, I object to this, 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 and this, and then they can give the sentence. Many times, judges don't really give you the opportunity to do that. They just go, okay, well, my sentence is boom. Basically, during sentencing, just listen, and at the very end, do your best to handle any objections, all right? And what are things you can object to uh, during sentencing? There's not a whole lot. Um, you know, you can argue over the time, but it's really discretionary. You can ar argue over probation, but that's also discretionary. Um, the things that you want to be looking for are things that are sort of blatantly unlawful. So if your client's being sentenced to too high of a term, or if um, there are, are illegal probation conditions. Um, so what are some illegal probation conditions? Um, this, these have actually been kind of a big issue on appeal, and you see a lot of cases on this. Um, a lot of times judges tell your client, uh, don't be around any illegal drugs, don't be around gang members, don't be around bad people, don't be around people who look funny. You know, they, they, they basically just give a whole bunch of conditions that they think are good. Um, and a lot of them leave out basically a scienter requirement that is an intent requirement or basically knowledge. Right? So they'll say, you know, this is a gang offense. Do not hang out with any people that are in a gang. And the courts have found that that condition is basically invalid because you don't know who's in a gang just by looking at someone, usually. But so they've required this condition to be knowingly. You know, do not knowingly hang out with someone who's in a gang, right? So if you're hanging out with someone and they're dressed like me and you have no reason to think they're in a gang and it turns out they are in a gang, and then you get arrested by probation, you may have a defense because you didn't know. But if someone is wearing all red and has a bandana hanging out the back of their pocket, uh, well, hire me. <laughs> or you're <all> with you. <laughs> so um, in terms of sentencing, make sure that the judge is not relying on things that they can't under the law. Usually that just means things like um, successful diversions, arrests that did not rely that did not result in convictions. Um, also, judges, well, there's case law that says judges cannot rely on evidence that was suppressed after a motion to suppress. Um, of course, since that wonderful case came down, there's uh, Proposition 8 passed, there's now the truth and evidence law. Um, that's a whole class into itself. But the answer is um, whether the case law that says they can't consider that uh, is still good is arguable. So just know that there's an arguable issue there. The DA may have a different opinion and it hasn't been sorted out yet. Um, alloc allocution. What the hell does that mean? I never actually, I, that was something I never knew. You ever been in court and hear uh, the judge say, uh, is there any reason why I shouldn't sit your client now? You guys ever see, heard that or seen that? That's what allocution is basically. It's basically the law requires that they formally ask if there's any reason why your client shouldn't be sentenced. And then the typical response is, quote, no legal cause, no legal cause. You guys heard that? They say no legal cause, right? And I was wondering, what the hell do they mean, no legal cause? Well, it basically just means that there are no legal reasons why the judge should not sentence your client. Um, so 99% of the time, you're going to just say no legal cause. Um, but I listed a few other acceptable answers, including my client is presently insane. Um, there's calls for a new trial, priors are bad, things of that nature. So, um, so if you ever get that question um, and there's an issue, then raise it before sentencing because those are things that could affect sentencing. Um, so let's talk, I, I, I talked about probation conditions. I didn't talk actually about um, misdemeanors in their normal sentence. So I'll briefly hit that and then we'll move on. Uh, misdemeanors, by law, um, are six months is the maximum jail time you can serve for a misdemeanor unless otherwise prescribed by law. 
Some misdemeanors um, say that you can be punished up to a year. So there are six months misdemeanors and there are one year misdemeanors and you pretty much have to just look at the statute book. If it's not listed, then it's a six month misdemeanor. And if it explicitly says one year, then it's a one year misdemeanor. If it's a wobbler, that's a misdemeanor that could be a felony, it's probably a one year misdemeanor. So, um, so that's the maximum. Um, usually we don't see that too often, but if your client has a very long record involving felonious conduct or lots of prior offenses for the same thing, um, you, you could come closer or see that every now and again. Something else you see at sentencing is restitution. Um, a lot of times at, at sentencing, particularly at pleas, you always hear restitution reserved, restitution reserved, restitution reserved. It's kind of annoying actually. Exactly. But what is restitution and why are we reserving it? Restitution basically means that any damage a criminal defendant does or any economic losses they cause have to be repaid by the defendant, all right? Um, restitution laws actually are probably the most pro-prosecution laws I've ever seen. Um, they're incredibly prosecution friendly. Um, you know, if, if the, def you know, the defendant has a right to a restitution hearing, so that's good, but um, the victims as well as anyone else claiming losses from the crime uh, pretty much can meet their burden at that hearing uh, just by submitting paperwork, a letter, testimony. Um, actually, most of the time what you see is the probation officer calls them and just says, how much money did you lose? And they say like $10,000 and then gets put into a probation report and then they come and most judges consider that prima facie showing of what the losses were. And then at that point the burden shifts to defense to show that these values are completely wrong and out of the picture. You know, basically unreasonable. And that's a very hard burden to show. So um, restitution's hard, but I think the best way of looking at those is sort of mini trials into themselves. I mean, it's kind of like a civil trial on damages. And honestly, I think that um, we often fold on these because it's really, really hard. But you know, some of the things that I've been doing is when people are claiming time off and things like that, just doing little things like sending a subpoena to make sure they actually took time off. Right? And just check, just doing things like that. And then if something's wrong with that, then maybe do something more thorough, right? Um, you know, obviously you can't spend all your time chasing down, uh, you know, pennies. But, um, but just something to look into because restitution is real. It will be a civil judgment against your client if it's not paid. And perhaps uh, the worst effect of an unpaid restitution order is that it prevents uh, a conviction from being expunged in the future. So, you know, you get a guy or a girl, commit some misto, good behavior for four years, doesn't pay back the 500 bucks, and here they are stuck with the conviction that they should be getting off their records so they could get a job and move on with their life. So restitution um, is important, but it is an uphill battle uh, as it presently stands. Um, let's talk about appeal. All right, so your client is sentenced. Um, there's a sentence in place, there's a restitution order in place. Um, what do you do if you want to appeal? You gotta file a notice of appeal. You gotta do it within 30 days from the day that judgment was entered, or the you know, which is the day your client was sentenced. That's calendar days, not court days. And if you miss that deadline, your client has very, very little recourse in terms of appeal. When should you file a notice of appeal? Right away, you walk out. I mean, I mean, how do we put it a different way? In every case? Within 30 days. Yes. So yes. you follow it in every single case, you follow a notice of appeal? Because All of right. Wendy. All right, and why? Because the Wendy case. Because what? The Wendy case. To so when? No, Wendy appeal? No. Wendy? Wendy yeah. appeal? Well, no, um, so yeah, there's different schools, yeah. honestly, there's no right answer. I mean, let me, there really is no right answer. I mean, let me tell you your ethical duties and I'll tell you what I do and then make it up on your own, all right? So your ethical duties are this. If you feel that there's any cause for an appeal, basically any rational legal grounds for appeal, you have a legal duty to inform your client of that, um, reason for appeal, at which point they will almost certainly tell you to file the notice of appeal. If you do not believe that you have any rational grounds for appeal, 
you do not have a duty to file a notice of appeal unless your client tells you to, at which point you have to file one regardless of whether you think there's merit or not. All right? And the courts have argued over what merit means and what merit doesn't mean. I think for our purposes, if you think you have more than a 0% chance of winning, you should probably file a notice of appeal. Um, in my cases, I typically file a notice of appeal except for when I believe my client received a deal that's so good that it doesn't even matter if there was error. All right? So let me give you an example. Let's say that your client is driving down the street in their car and then they get pulled over and inside their car is stuff from 10 houses. <laughs> Turns out all 10 houses were burglarized on the same day and your, and your client has a smartphone in his pocket where the GPS coordinates put him at every single house <laughs> that mentioned all the stuff in his car. <laughs> Let's further say his fingerprint is on every single doorknob. All right? All right, so he's charged with 10 first degree, first degree burglaries. Well, first degree burglaries is a strike. Well, your client's facing 10 strikes. So he's now facing basically 25, 25 to, life, to life, right? Let's say that the DA gives me an offer um, or it goes to trial, and, for, and it's a second degree commercial burglary offer, which is a felony, but it's not a strike. Uh, it's actually a wobbler, and let's say my client goes to prison for the max on that, and it's a, a, a two, three, well, it's 234 or it's a 16-2-3, I can't remember. 16-2-3. So my client goes to prison for, for, there you go, <laughs> my, my client goes to prison for three years, all right? Am I gonna follow a notice of appeal in that case? And the answer is no, because there's nothing better that could possibly happen, right? You know, your guy was facing 10 strikes. He pled to a second degree burg. If there was some error, it's not gonna get him off of 10 bergs. In a situation like that, I might not file one, and I might counsel my client not to file one. Any type of hard fault litigation, though, where your client falls with something bad, you pretty much want to file one. Um, part of the reason I file them is because even if I didn't see the error, sometimes the other attorney did. And you never know what you don't know. You know, I might have thought that there were no issues, and then they go, oh, you forgot to do a Miranda hearing, and uh, there was a Miranda problem. So, um, so it's important to have that second set of eyes, I think. And sometimes the appellate attorneys will jack you in the brief and say, you should have done stuff you shouldn't have done. And you just take this learning experience. Uh, you, won't get, you won't get in trouble unless your client proves that he was actually innocent. So it's all good. So follow that notice of appeal most of the time. I'm just going to mention one last thing before we break in three minutes. Um, motions to suppress. In misdemeanor cases, they, you have a right to what's called an interlocutory appeal. Does anyone know what that is? You appeal it. You can appeal in the middle of the case. Typically speaking, you can only file an appeal once judgment has been entered, i.e. your client has been sentenced, but there's an exception. And the actual 1538.5 statute in a misdemeanor case, they permit you to appeal that mid-case if you file your 1538 motion within 45 days of arraignment. End of story. All right, and frankly, um, that you know, there's some argument over whether that statute applies to appeals. Um, but our courts, for the most part, have been interpreting it as applying to appeals. So file the 1538 within 45 days and leave that argument for someone else. Um, but that's a huge tool. And if you have a case where you know you don't really have a good case to try on the merits, um, those interlocutory appeals, um, I think, are great for search and seizure issues if you have them. And at the very least, they push the case out like four months. I'm not saying file frivolous appeals. I'm just saying it doesn't hurt. All right. Are there any questions? Sometimes, like when a client wants you to file it, you don't think you see any reasons, but you go to file it. Mm -hmm. I, I've seen kind of an automatic appeal where you just raise a few constitutional issues. There's, um, and I haven't seen one in a while, but uh, I'd like to see one where you, where you just have about three or to get the, the due process and mm -hmm. without legal, denial of equal protection, you know, things like that. And you just, mm -hmm. you know, just try to raise all possible issues some appellate lawyer might see. And, mm -hmm. not, not, and not be very specific in a case where you don't know it yourself. Right. No, I, I, I agree with that. You know, if you, if you have to file one, mention as many things as you can. Um, 
you, you know, your notice of, of appeal actually doesn't have to even be that specific either. Um, you can actually just file it and be like, I don't even know. You know, you have to actually, what you do have to put in it is you do have to put the hearing that you're appealing from. Um, so if your guy went to trial on a certain date and then got sent on a certain date, make sure those dates are in your notice of appeal. But you don't actually have to necessarily put, I'm appealing because of prejudicial misconduct. You can just file it and then the appellate attorney kind of gets the first crack at it. With one exception, if objections weren't made at the time, those issues are waived. There's nothing the appellate attorney can do, and that's up to the trial attorney to make the proper objections at the right time. Um, but, other, but, but you make those right objections, then you follow notice of appeal, and it could be, and it could be argued up top. And the, the question I have, I'm, I was used to always, when I found notice of appeal, always filing the, the notice to the clerk to file this, and the notice to the to the court reporter to file this and that. And then I get complaints from judges later, like, I just stripped our files. Uh, so uh, do you think that's the proper thing to do, to always list all the possible uh, things to be, including the voir dire during yeah, the Yeah, so, uh, uh, yeah, so when you follow. When you follow a notice of appeal, um, there's a, it's actually statutory. So, yeah. so what happens is um, when you follow a notice of appeal in misdemeanor cases, they prepare certain documents. And in felony cases, they prepare another set of documents. And in motion to suppress appeals, they prepare another set of documents. All right? So um, sometimes you, you know, they, it's called a record, a limited record, a normal record. They all have really weird names. All right? At the very least, you, sh you should be getting the transcripts of the hearings that you're contesting. And you should be getting um, any exhibits that were admitted in that hearing and any paperwork or motions filed that relate to that hearing. Um, but when you're trying to challenge everything, like in a felony case, I, I think you know, what you said is right. Um, sometimes they don't put the voir dire in it unless you specifically ask them to. And so you might want to ask for that because without the voir dire transcript, um, your appellate attorney can't raise, say, a, a Batson-Wheeler issue, right? Um, does everyone know what that is? Batson Wheeler issue means um, excluding jurors for impermissible purpose, usually race, gender, uh, sexual orientation, things like that. Um, so yeah, you need to ask for that stuff. Um, if you think that there was an issue in the 1538, but let's say you missed the 45 day deadline, so now this has to be raised after appeal, you actually have to tell them, we need the transcript for the 1538 and from the trial, not just from the trial. Uh, because we're appealing everything. So yes, um, do keep that in mind. And there are judicial counsel forms you actually can use for filing this stuff. All this stuff is just you go on the website, phone the PDF. And on a felony case, um, it's actually just one form. It's actually almost easier in a felony case. In a misdemeanor case, you actually have to fill out supplemental forms that talk about how you want the record prepared, things that are included in the record, whether you want an attorney appointed. And the reason why it's a little bit more arduous in misdemeanor cases is because those appeals are handled locally from this court by attorneys appointed in this court, whereas the felony one, the notice of appeal goes up to the court of appeal, and then they handle everything themselves for the most part.